I've talked a lot about designing programs so that we can change the way we represent data. Well, what does that mean to represent data? Let's take a look. So, if I want to know whether I have a representation for a rational number that makes sense, what do I really need to know is true about that representation? What is it that makes data data? Well, really what we need to guarantee is that there's a certain relationship between the constructor and selector functions. They need to work together to specify the right behavior. So for instance, in the case of rational numbers, a behavior condition that guarantees that we have an accurate representation would say that if we construct a rational number x from a numerator and a denominator, then actually dividing the numerator by the denominator should equal n divided by d, the original numbers that we used in the constructor. So an abstract data type is some collection of selectors and constructors together with some behavior conditions to specify their relationship. There is an example for rational numbers, but we could have something similar for dates or whatever other abstract data type we want to invent. If the behavior conditions are met, then the representation is valid. We have data. So you can recognize abstract data types by their behavior, not just by their class as it's printed out when you call the type function. Let's look at the behavior conditions of a pair, because a pair is something that we needed in order to implement rational numbers. To implement a rational number, we use the two element tuple. But what does the behavior of a pair need to be in order for us to use it to implement rational numbers? Well, we need constructors, selectors, and behavior conditions. So, if a pair P was constructed from elements X and Y, then it should be the case that if I get item on that pair with index 0, I'll get X back. And likewise, if I get item on P, that pair, with the index 1, I should get Y back. Now, I'm using get item underscore pair as a selector name here, which is different from the built-in selector in Python because we're just going to build one that works only for pairs. Whereas the built-in one is far more general, but we don't quite know enough to define it yet. So, if we had a constructor and selectors that behaved in this way, well, they'd be inverses of each other. So selecting would just be a way to undo the construction. And generally that's true of what are called container types. So those are types whose job it is to contain other values and put them together. That's what a pair does. It bundles together two objects into one. But remember that the fact that the selector and the constructor were inverses of each other wasn't always true. In fact, for our rational number definition, it wasn't true because we reduced the fractions to lowest terms using the greatest common divisor. We're going to define a constructor for pairs, which takes in any two values, x and y, and it will return a pair. And then we're going to define a function get item pair, which is the selector, taking in some pair p and an index, where that index is either 0 or 1, and it will return either the element at index 0 or 1. Then I should be able to, for instance, define some point on a grid as a pair 2, 4, and then get the y coordinate of that pair by calling get item pair on the point that I created, and then passing in 1 as the index of the second element. Okay, so I only have function stubs here. I need an implementation. The way we're going to implement a pair in this case, just to show that it can be different from a tuple, is to uh, implement it as a function. So I'm going to define a function called dispatch, which takes in the index that I'm looking for. And if i is 0, it's going to return x. 
Otherwise, if i is 1, it's going to return y. We'll leave it unspecified what happens when i is 0 or 1, because those are the only two values that we really want. And then the pair that I call will actually return this function, dispatch, which is a nested function with access to the values x and y. And then get item pair is just going to take one of these pairs implemented as a function and call it on i. And then I need to actually return this. Okay, so let's see what we've done. I have a point defined. The point is a function, but it behaves as a pair. What do I mean by that? Well, if I call my selector on that point, and I select the first element, I'll get 2. And if I select the second element, I'll get 4. So I have, in fact, constructed something that behaves just like a pair. So it is a pair. The functional pair implementation that we just looked at starts with a function that looks like this, and that function that we define within it, dispatch, is really representing a pair. And the constructor is a higher order function that returns that dispatch. Get item pair is a selector, and the selector figures out what element to return by just asking the object itself. We can quickly look at the environment diagram for this example and see that we're not doing anything new, but we're able to represent pairs. So we create the pair function, we create get item pair the selector, point calls the pair function with x bound to 2 and y bound to 4, then creates dispatch. The parent of dispatch is this frame, which remembers the values in the pair. So when we call get item pair on this point, we introduce a new frame. We're looking up element at index 1, which is the second element, which involves calling the dispatch function, passing in the argument 1, and here we return y. Where is y? Well, in the current environment, it's not in this frame, so we look at its parent. y is bound to 4. So the whole point of this diagram is that it's showing how the mechanics of the language we've set up so far, using nothing but higher order functions, can represent compound data types and fulfill the requirements of an abstract data type by having constructor and selectors that behave just as they should to represent a pair. If I go about using the functionally implemented pair, it's a little bit different than if I were using a tuple, because I call get item pair instead of get item, and I call a function to construct this thing. But the behavior is the same. As long as we don't evaluate the abstraction barriers, we don't even need to know that this is a function that we're creating and binding to p. All we need to know is that if a pair p was constructed from the elements x and y, then get item with index 0 returns x, and with index 1 returns y. Those are the only rules for being a pair.